UN Security Council will hold an emergency meeting today to discuss Israeli military action carried out yesterday in Damascus against Iranian intelligence officials who were, according to the New York Times, meeting with top Hamas officials as well as members of Islamic Jihad. At least seven Iranian military officials were killed, with several reportedly being top officers. That's after an Israeli airstrike hit a building next to Iran's embassy. This puts the entire region on edge and escalates the proxy war between Iran and Israel that has been going on for years. This move brings the hostilities out into the open. Iran supports Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon, where there have been an uptick in skirmishes. Now, here to discuss with us these implications is Trita Parsi of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. So let's get right into it. Um, what do you think is going to be the response to this airstrike that killed these Iranian officials? So the Iranians have, for quite some time, absorbed a tremendous amount of blows and very, very hard blows from the Israelis without any clear retaliation. Uh, and there is growing pressure internally within the regime in which there is a faction that strongly believes that the lack of a response thus far is what has enabled Israel to uh, escalate matters further. And this is a significant escalation because that building is part of the diplomatic compound, which means that it was striking uh, a, a diplomatic um, uh, uh, facility uh, as part of the embassy. And this is a significant escalation because that is technically Iranian territory. The previous Iranian red line has been to treat attacks by Israel against Iranian or, or other um, uh, military officials in Syria or in Lebanon as attacks on Lebanon, attacks on Syria, not attacks on Iran. This time around, that's not going to uh, fly because this is technically Iranian territory. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure. What they can do, however, without further escalating matters into a full-blown war, which clearly the Iranians and Hezbollah does not want. The Biden administration says that it too does not want that, but the Israelis increasingly are saying that they do want the larger confrontation, at least with Hezbollah. That is the trick for them right now to see how can they try to restore their deterrence, strike back, but not give the Israelis a pretext for a full-scale war. Can you speak to what Biden's response has been to this? And also, can you provide some more t context about how sort of irregular the strike was? You've mentioned that it was an attack on a military, uh, no, sorry, on a government, uh, a diplomatic facility, uh, a consulate that is adjacent to an embassy. Perhaps you can provide some analogy that would give us a sense of how sort of ir irregular that kind of a strike is in world events. So. It's diplomatic practice for quite some time, historically, that diplomatic compounds and facilities are off limits, including during war. It is extremely unlikely, uh, unusual for a country to actually target another country's diplomatic facilities. Remember when the United States did so uh, by accident, according to the uh, uh, Clinton administration, hit the Chinese embassy in, uh, in Serbia. Uh, the other example, of course, ironically, is when the Iranian students took the American embassy in 1979 and held 52 American diplomats hostage for 444 days. Um, so it, it was something that obviously profoundly uh, angered the United States. It is something that isolated Iran because it was such a violation of such a clear and important norm. What we have seen from the Israelis in the last six months, in my estimation, is a systematic and deliberate effort to actually destroy a lot of these norms, or at a minimum, uh, hollow them out so much so that the Israelis can position themselves above those norms and be untouchable, essentially, and a new normal in which it will not be held to those same norms. Because we have seen a systematic uh, effort to uh, uh, undermine these norms, everything from you know, um, uh, using forced starvation as a weapon of war, which is a war crime, to the attacks against hospitals, which of course in the beginning they denied and now they're bragging about. They have bombed every single hospital in Gaza. They have even gone inside of hospitals to assassinate patients there. To the uh, torturing of UN staff, I mean, these are unheard things. Um, uh, has never really happened before. And I think it's of, of such a scale and so systematic that it's difficult to presume that it's just part of uh, uh, their war efforts and not part of a larger 
uh, objective, and that objective, I think, would be to actually start destroying some of these norms that guide the laws of war. Is there a risk of this, I mean, Jesus, is this becoming World War III or something? I mean, the U.S. has to be concerned for its own security, for the blowback we could face given our support of Israel. You know, is it possible for, for someone to support Israel being able to retaliate or take out the terrorist group that attacked it, you know, without thinking that a, a direct war with Iran that the U.S. would be dragged into is at all a conceivable idea? Look, we're, we're way past the moment in which the Israelis are retaliating for uh, what happened on October 7th. Um, and it's, you know, essentially self-defense. We're way past that point because we're talking about more than 32,000 people killed, uh, a very large amount of them being children, the majority being children and women. And then uh, all of these different other attacks uh, in Libya, uh, sorry, in Lebanon, in Syria. Uh, and of course, what we have seen uh, in the treatment of um, uh, aid workers, etc. You saw the aid workers that got killed yesterday. So we're past that that point. There's obviously uh, uh, a desire in many quarters to be able to defend um, Israel's right to defend itself. But that was a long time ago. This is no longer a defensive war by any stretch of the imagination. And I go back to something I've said on your show many times, because you're pointing in that direction. I think you're absolutely correct in doing so. This is tremendously dangerous for the United States. After Iraqi militias pressured the U.S. for a ceasefire by attacking U.S. Uh, facilities and bases, so did Syrian militia, so did the Houthis. Uh, the Biden administration chose not to push for a ceasefire, but instead escalated and started targeting a lot of those different militias, killing quite a few of them. They also put pressure on the Iranians. The Iranians put pressure on the Iraqi militias because the Iranians don't want a larger war. For six weeks, there's not been a single attack by the Iraqi militias against the United States. The Houthis have continued to do what they do because they are by no means uh, as close to Iran as the U.S. narrative about them has portrayed them as. But now we're risking a situation in which, uh, going back to your earlier question, what will the Iranians do, that the Iraqi militias may start attacking U.S. troops again as a result of what the Israelis have done. The Iranians sent a message to the U.S. through the Swiss immediately after that attack. I suspect what they're signaling is that they're holding the U.S. responsible for what Israel does just as much as the U.S. holds Iran responsible for what the Iraqi militias do. Um, and by that essentially are signaling that they may be breaking the truce that has existed now for six weeks between the Iraqi militias, Iran, uh, and the U.S. If that happens, then yes, we will get much closer towards a larger war. The Biden administration's response will likely be to escalate matters further. And it will also show that the Israelis, by attacking the Iranian consulate uh, in Damascus, put a target on the back of American soldiers in the region. Dr. Parsi, I don't want the uh, killing of the seven uh, aid workers to just pass as a food note. These were workers with the World Central Kitchen. Uh, the World Kitchen was operating to bring direly needed food into the war zone. Founder Chef Jose Andreas, who has operated in Ukraine, Haiti, and myriad other conflict areas, says that the killing was targeted. Can you just explain to us what happened and why there does seem to be some pretty clear evidence that the this was a targeted strike? Well, the, the most obvious evidence for that is that they had coordinated matters with the Israeli Defense Forces, had uh, informed them about their whereabouts, where they're heading, uh, the routines in which they will be going in and out of Gaza to provide that food. And the Israelis have said that they're going to allow these things. And then they were yet targeted and their vehicle was clearly um, um, uh, had the signs and the logos of the organization. So this was not something that uh, the Israelis were unaware of in any way, shape or form. And again, we have seen this pattern so many times now that they do something extremely provocative, norm breaking. Uh, at first, it will be a benefit of the doubt given by Western governments and Western media. And then later on, of course, it will turn out that that benefit of the doubt was not warranted in any way, shape or form. But by that time, they have already created a new normal. The only way to prevent this is to actually leapfrog and start holding Israel accountable for the manner in which it is breaking norms and rules. I mean, remember, 
The United States uh, otherwise is quite um, unforgiving of countries that break such norms, ac accusing them of being rogue states, pariah states, states that are undermining what the U.S. calls the rules-based international order. No state has done as much of that kind uh, than Israel in the last six months, and we have not heard a peep from the administration about that. If there are no consequences, uh, no accountability for this type of norm-breaking war crimes, uh, then we should also have very low expectations that the Israelis will change course. Yeah, it's worth noting that uh, it's being reported that there were three cars associated with this food aid effort, that after the first one was struck, survivors went to a second car. That car was then struck, survivors went to a third car, again, underscoring how targeted uh, Israel is able to be in these sorts of attacks, and I think raising some questions about what it means for so many civilians to have been killed when they have the ability to be so precise with their attacks. Just on the accountability if point, I could just make one please. quick mention, uh, point on that as well, which is to just support what you just said, because it also shows that the Israelis have some very significant and, and quite impressive intelligence knowing that the Iranian military officials were meeting in that building uh, uh, that diplomatic compound in Damascus with those other individuals from Islamic Jihad, et cetera. It takes a, a tremendous amount of very precise intelligence to know that. They also managed to strike that building alone, even though it is squeezed between the Iranian and the Canadian embassies. Um, so the Israeli ability to be able to have excellent intelligence and act in a very targeted way was shown just hours before or after the killing of the, uh, uh, the aid workers. And again, that further undermines any credibility uh, from the Israeli side to say that this was a mistake or that they didn't know what they were doing. Just to your point earlier about accountability, uh, there were several foreign nationals represented among the seven aid workers that were killed, including uh, someone with a dual American-Canadian citizenship, um, uh, someone from Poland and, and other places around the world. Uh, what kind of response have we seen or do we expect from the countries uh, from the people uh, that represented the people that were killed there, including the United States? So far, we've seen some statements, some slightly more harsh and angry statements than before. But from what we've seen from the Biden administration is wholly insufficient because it's asking the Israelis to investigate themselves. And that keeps on happening even when they kill Americans. Remember the American journalist that was killed about two or so years ago, uh, in which the Israelis were asked to uh, investigate themselves. And eventually it turned out that, of course, they knew exactly what they were doing and they were specifically targeting her. But by that time, the United States had moved on. There is absolutely no credibility in any Israeli investigation at this point. If there's going to be anything serious, it has to be a UN investigation, an impartial, independent investigation. But we have not seen the Biden administration getting even close to the point of requesting that, even when Israel is killing Americans. Mm. Dr. Trita Parsi, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.